People of Earth, attention! This is the Mutual Audio Network. The following audio drama is rated PG for parental guidance. Book genres are so 20th century. No, 19th century. They made sense when each book needed to be placed on a physical shelf so people could find similar titles. But what if you want to find a vampire romance, a post-apocalyptic comedy, a Western mystery where the main character is an android, a World War II adventure with magic, or a story based around a character of any race or religion or gender, set in any time or any place you choose? Scribble now brings searching for books into the 21st century, even if you're looking for one set in the 17th. Find the books you'll love by selecting the story elements that matter to you at Scribble.com. You'll never look for books the same way again. Search by story elements only at Scribble.com. That's S-C-R-I-B-L dot com. Previously on The Mask of Inanna... You're going to make me do this, aren't you? Do what? You're thinking about giving up the show. What show? This is the reanimated corpse of After Dark. They want you to finish the After Dark shows. Think you can do that? You know he's lying to you. Yes, I know. When the last episode of this show is over, you'll be dead. Len, this is Dorothy. How do you do, sir? And these are her crew, uh, Hicks and Richard. Dick's fine. How about it? Scotty, we're cutting our way in there. No! No! <laughs> the wing severed the microphone cable. There has to be a soldering iron in the table drawer. No! Oh, oh, no! no calling for help. It'll be more fun this way. The Mask of Inanna. Len. Come on, Len. Up the stairs. You can do it. There you are. No, this way. The studio's over here. You remember, don't you, Len? Yes. Well, this is another fine mess you've gotten us into. Go away. I'm tired of you. Tired of me? But I'm the star, Sonny Boy. You're the limo. I don't see why you're keeping us here. Bob's going to use us for show after show. Then trash us like a wet tissue. Bob likes me. My check's big. Everywhere in America, they hear me. You know the truth. Nobody hears you. The people in the same room don't hear you. They don't air your shows in Hollywood. They put on enough pantomime that you believe them. You want to be the star... Throw a fit. Stop following Bob. Turn left here. Turn right here, Len. All right. What kind of a star follows orders to the letter? Demand a drink, a raise, a date with Bob's secretary. The girl heading over here right now. You're still a man. Mr. Stroud, what do you think you're doing? I have to get Len to his show. Orders from the top. You know the rules. You do not parade persons under your thrall around the offices in public. What if someone sees him? I know, but it's quicker this way, and it's evening. Everybody's gone home. You think they haven't wiped out better men than you for less than this? Take his shoulder. I'll take the other one. Come on, Len. Len, got to get you to your show. That's more like it. You're not going to call her a cutie. Or shake your arm free and show them how a real star walks? I'm a professional. I won't act like some fool like Matt did in After Dark. You think they like you? Those two toadies gnawing for scraps at the bottom of the pyramid? Yes, I do. Ask Julie how many fingers she'd burn off for you. 
I won't ask her that. Ask her if she'd jump off a cliff for you. In return, I'll be quiet for a little while. You promise? I promise. All right. Julie? Yes, Len? Would you jump off a cliff for me? I, uh, sure, Len. Len, we don't have time for games. Big grimace for the show, okay? Okay. Thank you, Julie. She's patronizing you, Alan. I know. But I'm nearly at my show. I've been waiting all week for this. You can put the fear of the devil himself into them if you want. Bob and Julie. They'll respect you for it. How could I do that? Shake them off you and walk through the studio door. It's your show. You deserve it. I deserve it. Julie won't patronize you anymore. I deserve it. What's the matter, Len? Hands off. What did you say, Len? You better keep him under control. I'll walk into my own studio. Sure, sure, Len. You can do that, Len. And you'll do the show. And I'll do my show. Of course, Len. I don't like this. I'm going to tell the boss. I'm fine. I've got him. Nothing to worry about. Go on, Len. Okay, everyone, I'm here. Your star is here. Ellen is here. Krask is here. And you will look at me when I come in the room! It's under control, folks. I have him. I've got the star. I'm going to walk him over here. Len, look at me, Len. There's your seat. There's your microphone. My own microphone. And the script. Can't have the show without the script. Read it over again. Yes, this is a good one. There, that's not so hard, is it? Every ear is on you now. Soon they'll all hear me. Even Gwen, my beloved Gwen. Across the nation. Across the universe. Radio signals go on forever. We'll see about that. Places, people, places. Yeah, I know we don't usually do it in the same room as him, but we're running late. Bring me a candle. Thank you. Kill the lights, every one of them. Everyone, be at prayer. Glory to he that watches us. Glory to he that teaches us. Glory to he that knows the minds of men and delivers us to perfection. Glory to truth. Glory to reward. Glory to man. We gather to sing his praises to deliver the stolen prayer that it might please him. Glory to truth, glory to reward, glory to to man. Man began in darkness, in his own darkness, in the darkness of others, in the darkness of the world, and there was hate. And darkness begat darkness, stagnant begat stagnant. And man begat light. First, the light of a man. By knowing oneself, the spark arises. This candle... I light from my very being. And man grew stronger. Glory be to mammon. Then the light of a people. By knowing each other, the spark is passed among us. Your candles you light from knowing mine. And mankind grew strong with the great leaders. Glory be to mammon. At last, the world was lit. And those who remained in darkness were guided by those with light. And the light penetrated all. But only those who bore their own light had understanding. And it is their duty to guide the others. It is their reward to reap bounty from the Dark Ones that the Dark Ones will not use. So it has been. So it shall be. Glory to Mammon. Glory to him. For his delight. For his grace. We deliver this prayer to him. Blessed is he. Blessed will he become. Amen. All right, let's get this show on the road. Len? Len, it's your big moment. Are you ready? Yes. Hells, yes. And I'm doing my own lines, not these. Great, you'll be fine, Len. I'll listen for a little while, but then I have to go. These people will care for you. 
or Julie. I'll, I'll get Julie. You like her, don't you? She'd jump off a cliff for me. You know it. All right, folks. We're starting in ten. Nine. Get to your posts at Still Church. Six. Five. Four. Play Alan's intro for him. Go! You're out awfully late tonight. It really isn't safe, you know. You should be at home, sitting by the fire. Having a drink and relaxing. Listening to your radio. That's good. You're running. Running for home. But it's too late. Too late to run for home now because you've been caught out. After dark. <coughs> Winsley Wheat presents After Dark. Tales of mystery and fright. Winsley Wheat, what a treat. Get your boy or girl upbeat. Mr. Krask. Mr. Krask! Huh? Uh, darn it, just roll the commercial. Go! Ah, a hard week at the office finally over. Now I get to kick my heels off and relax in the backyard. Oh no, a bee! Hi there, sport! You spent all week being busy with the best of them? You can talk? That's right, sugar. I'm the Winsley Wheat Recipe. And I'm telling everyone about the sweet deals available at your local grocer. Did you know that every bag of Winsley Wheat flour contains that farmland goodness you've come to expect? And a new recipe printed on the back. Each recipe is especially designed to enhance the flavors from Winsley Wheat products. And there's a new one every month. I had no idea. All right, you can sit on my nose. Thanks. It's a queen of a deal. This month, we have a treat that'll take the sting out of anything. Winsley Wheat Super Sweet Honey Buns. Guaranteed to make your kids buzz and your husband melt. They sound delicious. Thanks, Miss Recipe. I don't want to drone on too long, so I gotta fly. Just remember to check out all the Winsley Wheat products at your grocer. They're the stuff to make your recipes bloom. Oh, I can't lie around anymore. I must make myself a batch of those honey buns. Maybe I'll even leave some for my family. You ain't misbehaving. Everything's better with... Winsley Wheat, what a treat. Get your boy or girl a beat. Mr. Allen, you're on. Yes, I am. Go! Why, hello. I'm sorry I didn't see you there hiding in the corner. May I see some identification? You can't be too careful these days. Who am I? Why, Dr. Damien Krask of After Dark. Were you expecting someone else? Not tonight. Surely you remember me. Terror of the airwaves. Not good enough. You want to see my papers. They're all here, all in order. I've nothing to hide. Just like the hero of tonight's tale. He has the dirty job of finding traitors to our great nation, but his name will never be in a history book. Let me ask you, how well do you know your best friend, your co-workers? Do you think they're jealous of that raise you earned? The one that gave you a better car? A better garden? Maybe they wonder if the world would be a better place if everyone was equal and you were strung up by your boots. Michael Svelte finds people like this in a tale I'm calling I Was a Communist for the CIA. For nine long years, I've traveled the globe leading a double life. As an inspector for the Central Intelligence Agency, I filed audits to ensure our allies were holding up their end of our treaties. Then I was contacted by a charming fellow, someone you'd give directions to on the street turned out to be a member of the Red Menace. He offered to recruit me. He'd read some of my writings and knew I was a sympathizer. I accepted. My writings were lies, though. My supervisors had entrusted me with this mission, to ferret out the Reds among us. I've had nine long years of assignments. In each one, there's always a girl, and I always fell for her. But I couldn't afford to take chances. I had to remain solitary. I'm Mike Svelte. 
and I'd sell out everyone I loved to keep one man from turning red. And so would you. I was a communist for the CIA. My contact in Washington nearly stammered on our secure line. They'd had a break, a big one, and he wanted me in on it. They'd received word from a communist spy who wanted to give them critical information. All they knew about the fellow was that he went by the name Inuit Snow and was sending coded radio transmissions from Fort Sulphur in Alaska. I was to meet with Dan Mater, another CIA inspector who, unlike me, was red through and through. He'd introduce me to the members of the base's cell. I'd leave a message at the scheduled drop point for our turncoat friend and wait. I met with Dan in his hotel room in Anchorage. It was summer, and out the window, the land was hot and lush with foliage. But inside, the room was as chilled and sterile as the Kremlin. Greetings, Comrade Michael. Comrade Daniel, I hear Central is very pleased with you. Likewise. I've checked the room for surveillance equipment. We may speak freely. Good. Your other assignments are going well, I trust? Very well, comrade. Mostly I smuggle these days. Our opium and cocaine shipments are corrupting the inner city neighborhoods as planned. I shipped embarrassing photos of politicians in tuna cans for a while, but we had an incident and had to stop. Right now I'm working on a joint project with the Chinese called Operation Grand Slam, but it won't be ready for years now. I know only what I need to know. A sensible position. But now I have orders for you. Straight from the Kremlin. Higher than Central. It is fortuitous that we are assigned to Fort Sulphur, because we have learned there is a traitor in our ranks here. Who? Moscow doesn't know yet, but this person goes by the name Inuit Snow. What's an Inuit? I don't know, but this traitor could cause a great deal of trouble for the party's plans in Alaska. We must do whatever it takes to find him, and, if necessary, terminate him. I understand, but forgive me a moment of human weakness... If we are unable to find this person, won't Moscow order the execution of all cell members there? Usually, yes. But we have some well-placed specialists among the base personnel, and the party does not want to lose them. Is that so? There must be a lot of them. More than ten, less than a hundred. Our contact will have the details. Are you losing your nerve, comrade? Never. My record speaks for itself. I'm a man, and I always perform my duty. This was bad. I wasn't expecting that Dan would know about Snow. He might know about the drop point, too. I had no way to ask him. I had to be careful. We flew out to the fort the following afternoon. Fort Sulphur held a contingent of the National Guard and Air Command. The base was impressive from the air, with the personnel's residences sprawling off into the Alaskan wilderness. We landed safely, and the guards checked our papers. We were supposed to be met by Colonel Nathan Frost, but he sent an envoy in his place. I didn't blame him at the time. A colonel's life is busy enough without ceremony. It was fortuitous that the envoy was Major Lawrence Oliver Thompson, head of base communications and our contact to the communist cell. Snow was his problem, too, in more ways than one. Welcome to Fort Sulphur, gentlemen. You must be tired from your flight. Thank you, Major. From what I've seen of the coast, it's a sailor's delight. They just take warning when they sail in the morning. My men will take your bags. I have a room ready at my quarters. My my wife is expecting you. She's putting in an extra pot roast. That's generous of her. Please, ride with me. Comrade Lawrence. This is Comrade Michael. How do you do? It's an honor to stay with you. I wish this could be at a better time. The plan is nearly ready to start, and we can't have this snow fellow ruining any part of it. We'll find him. The party wants success, and that's what we've always given them. Excellent. I'll start interviewing your cell tomorrow. Have you found any leads yourself recently? I haven't. You must be quick. Even without snow, Moscow would have called you here. I have another mission for you. I have a package that needs to go to a certain person in Washington without inspection. With your contacts and resources, it must arrive in this person's hands in exactly one week. It'll be secure with us, comrade. By the will of the people, I swear it. That's comforting to hear. 
There's been nothing but trouble since my wife and I were transferred here. Considering all that's happened, we're lucky the plan is as far along as it is. You sacrificed so much for it. If it were to be exposed, we'd never have a chance like this again. I wanted to ask what it was, what this plan could be, but I couldn't arouse suspicion. Snow was the only one who'd tell me. Lawrence took us to his home on a street as cheerful as any main street in the USA, provided you overlooked the four burlap-covered jeeps that cordoned off his house. A dozen soldiers stood in formation, rifles at their shoulder, watching us for any excuse to use force. This wasn't the welcome I was expecting, nor Lawrence. He was scared. I could see it in his twitching eyes. What's the problem, Private? Colonel Frost wishes to speak to you, sir. Tell him I'm on my way. He wishes to speak to you and the inspectors, sir. He's been waiting for your arrival. Here? Yes, sir. Tell him we're ready. Come with me. We have them secured, Colonel, sir. Colonel Frost was a career man with bulging shoulders and every hair on his head trimmed with efficiency. His dark eyes and firm chin said he wouldn't take lip from man or beast. He approached us with a surety to his step that all was right in the world except for Lawrence, Dan, and me. Lawrence was trembling. I'd never reveal my secrets to anyone, but if someone was to extract them from me, Frost was the man to do it. Major Thompson. Colonel Frost. Sir. A little birdie in my chain of command has spread a rumor that we may have communists among our visiting party here. Sir, their papers have been inspected and confirmed with the Pentagon. I have been made aware of this, Major. And I am aware of the notices that pass through my mail, warning me how high the red infiltration goes in my government. I'll need to do a full red check on these inspectors on my own. And they'll both be in the stockade until it's done. Sir, I will run a full check on their identities again. I said I will, Major, not you. Sending two inspectors at a moment's notice smells fishy to me. Like red mackerel. Or red snapper. Or red herring. Fair very well, sir. Sir... May I speak with you a moment? Certainly, Major. What's on your mind? Sir, I have also heard that we have communists on our base. Yes, I'm sure you have. And, sir, I may have a few contacts of my own. Do you, Major? Yes, sir. And my contacts may have already identified one or two suspected communist sympathizers on the base. Really, Major? And why didn't you mention this before? They were suspected, not confirmed, sir. Well, that's splendid, Major. But perhaps unnecessary. Why don't you bring me their names when you have something definite? You may keep your men on duty, and these two inspectors. But bear in mind that I may return in person if there's any trouble. Of course, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Company, let them go. We'll return to the base. Yes, sir. There won't be any trouble, will there, Major? No, sir. Good. As you were. The man had an iron stare. I had been sure all was lost. I didn't understand why he'd let us go. Dan and I stood solemn on the sidewalk, gripping our luggage as the jeeps rolled away, canvas flapping in the breeze. You'd better hurry inside. Thank you, comrade. I did what I had to. Have you reported him to Central? I have. But he's done nothing to threaten the plan, so they won't help us with him. No blackmail. Frost is untouchable. You were about to give two of your men for us. I was. The plan is that important. I need Snow gone, and I need that package in Washington. You're a good party member, comrade. I'll tell Central myself. Listen, comrade, I trust my men more than I trust you. But Moscow trusts you, and that's good enough for me. So don't patronize me. You want to thank me? Get me a moment's peace. Mrs. Thompson was waiting for us in the entryway. Lawrence was a lucky man. She was a knockout. All the hardship in her life had left her all the more dazzling. But she was nervous. You'd think she'd have been relieved when Colonel Frost released us. But no, she was pale. Welcome to our home, comrades. Let me take your coats. Thank you. We appreciate the hospitality, Comrade Thompson. Please, call me Iris. How are you, Comrade Iris? I'm lovely, thank you. She sure was. 
In all my years of service, I've never understood why a pretty woman would be a communist. From my experience, a red dame usually isn't a dame at all. You two must be tired. Come to the kitchen. I have supper ready. Mind if we help you? No. Your guests. You seem shaken is all. It's nothing. Comrade, let her be. I'll take your bags to your room. You and Comrade Daniel must sit and eat. Most communist dinners are solemn affairs, but this one was still as an icy tomb. Lawrence and Iris were reluctant to talk about their work, the corruption of the bourgeoisie, the glory of Moscow, the usual conversation over biscuits and gravy. I asked them about the Alaskan weather. That got a few words out. Dan was as frustrated as I was. Iris would have never joined us at that table if we hadn't insisted. She kept tending the stove. I was beginning to think it was personal. Funny thing was, she seemed disappointed when our plates were clean. I wondered if she'd been waiting for a chance to say something. A chance that never came. We hit the sack soon enough. I gave myself a little shut-eye, but it was hard to rest in that house. Around 2 a.m., when I was certain Dan was asleep, I crept outside and took a walk to the drop point. It was only a few blocks away, at a two-family home with a little garden on the side. I slipped a letter announcing my arrival, in code, of course, under the correct garden stone. I took the long way back to the Thompsons, and I didn't hear anyone following. I slipped into bed and awoke to Dan's alarm clock. He was already in the shower. When he came out, he had a surprise for me. Comrade, you slept well? Eventually, yes. What's on your mind? Look at this. I tried not to show any emotion when he tossed that dirty letter back at me. The same one I'd planted not a few hours ago. It had been opened. Our other friend has announced himself. Who? Snow's contact. You wouldn't know anything about that, comrade. No. Where'd you find this? It's not important. Come. The coffee is brewing, and we must get to our interviews. Real trust is an oxymoron in the Communist Party. You never know when a friend will turn for his own ambitious goals. Dan suggested we'd cover twice as many people if we conducted the interviews separately. I resisted, said we should perform them together. I didn't want to think what would happen if he found Snow first. The base assigned us a room to work in. Our cover was that we were developing a report of the base's activities for the Pentagon. Dan and I were behind a table as each man and woman sat in front of us and answered our questions. How long have you been stationed at this facility? How much do you know about fields outside your expertise? But for the cell members... Our questions turn different. What do you know about Snow? I want you to assassinate your commanding officer. Is that a problem? What Dan didn't know, and couldn't possibly see, is that under my clipboard, I had written, Snow isn't safe on the garden stones anymore. I lifted it when I was sure the person interviewed was looking my way. But the message was scribbled such that only someone who knew what it meant would give it a second glance. I hoped that, with any luck... Pentagon would receive a new drop point from Snow soon. We kept our meetings quick. After lunch, we had a most illuminating interview with Iris Thompson. She had her hair pinned up under a flowered hat, which she removed in our presence. She sat before us, and I flashed my clipboard. No response. Comrade Thompson, thank you for coming. We only have a few questions for you. I don't know why I'm here. My loyalty to the party is beyond reproach. I'm sure it is, Comrade Thompson. But all people are equal, and none should be given special treatment on the basis of their loyalty. You believe that, too? Of course. Tell us about snow. There's a lot of it around most of the year. I can sleep through the roar of the plow trucks now. I can't stand it, though. We want you to spy on your husband, Comrade Thompson. Follow his movements, even on the base. Send reports regularly to Central. I'll do it. I'll find a way. That won't be necessary. I'll pass any test you give me. Moscow knows that. Only the most devoted members to the cause were given the Alaskan assignment. I don't want to question the Kremlin's motives, but I noticed that neither of you were given this assignment. Perhaps I should be the one asking the questions. Iris, please. Ask me to assassinate someone. We have no such order. Ask me to commit sabotage. There's no doubt as to your loyalty, comrade. You're darned right there isn't. 
Because I will tell you, Comrade Michael and Comrade Daniel, how far my devotion goes. Several months every year, I share a bed with Colonel Frost. I have done this every year since I was moved here, since the party asked me to. I've borne the touch of that horrid man. You ask me about loyalty and assassination and sabotage, but you have yet to ask me how to silence a powerful man who cannot be swayed by blackmail and who has found out about the mission. He asked for me. The party gave him me. The party took me from Comrade Lawrence. Ask me to salute something, gentlemen. Ask me to quote Lenin. I will dance for you as I dance for all the party. I think we can conclude this interview. Comrade Thompson, where were you on the night of Thursday last week? Save it, Comrade Dan. Please do not interrupt me, Comrade Michael. I said save it. You can go, Comrade Iris. Comrade Daniel. Comrade Michael. I'll write something else in her report. We must report the truth. I think Moscow knows the truth, comrade. I think Moscow has not been informed of other methods of handling this situation. She said she had been doing this for years. Don't remind me. Moscow's will is the will of the party. Where are you going? Out. Our interviews aren't complete. You keep going. I want to talk to Colonel Frost. party sickened me. I'd seen a lot of heinous actions from the party over the years, but this one eclipsed them all. The communists are experts at silencing figures of authority. They could have had Frost transferred, killed, or threatened. There's no length to the depravity that communists will descend to. But with Iris, that was sloppy, bureaucratic. There had to be more to this. Mr. Svelte, sir. Afternoon, Private. I want to speak to Colonel Frost. That won't be a problem, will it? Colonel, sir, Mr. Svelte is here to speak to you. Send him in. Yes, sir. Go right on in. I think I will. Mr. Svelte, what did you want to see me about? I want to know why it's worth risking your career over Major Thompson's wife. Is that a threat? I heard it from her lips. She'll testify if I ask her. Any other proof? I'll get pictures if I have to. No, Mr. Svelte, you're going to leave this one alone. The hell I am. Language, sir. I see word travels fast in commie circles. And as fast at the Pentagon when I ask them to start an investigation. You wouldn't do that. You commies want your little plan to go on. Maybe I care more about Iris. What happens between us is our business, Mr. Svelte. It's her choice. That'll hold up in any court. You accuse me, you ruin her. Why, you twisted son of a snake. I know there are communists on my base, and I know you're one of them. The others haven't brought you up to speed, so I will. I noticed your little cell gathering from my neighborhood reports. I had microphones hidden and found out what you were up to. I have tapes safely stored away here should anything happen to me. Your cell leader, Major Thompson, would have told you not to come if you'd asked him. You're a monster, Frost. A disgrace to your uniform. I could give two flips what you and your red buddies are doing at my base, as long as the equipment passes inspection and everyone's duties are performed to satisfaction. I'll tell you, Mr. Svelte, the truth. You commies aren't a threat to anyone. You're content with a little scandal here or there, but you're too disorganized to alter the big picture. But you're useful for one thing. You've given us the Cold War. I love the Cold War. My troops get a hundred times the budget they need. They get the best equipment, best artillery, best training, and best pinball in the rec room. And from you, the poor, ineffectual, paranoid commies, I get your women. And their party loyalty keeps them coming back for more. I hope this war never ends. When your Soviet states eventually collapse in on themselves, we'll have to find a way to make more of you. Never! Oh, you've laid a hand on me. Private, have Mr. Svelte arrested for assaulting a colonel and throw him in the stockade. When you're done, call the other inspector and inform him of the situation. You'll never get away with this. I have for many years, Mr. Svelte. As long as there are communists... I'll be a very happy man. (laughs) 
They charged me, stripped me, and locked me in a cell. I'd been reckless, careless, put the whole operation in jeopardy. I sat on the little cot and held my head between my hands. I had to think. The Pentagon would send someone for me. Perhaps I could still find evidence. That'd get the charges dropped. The guard let a visitor in. It was Iris. She had the fury of the four winds in her cheeks and a look that would have cut steel. What on earth did you think you were doing? The party's gotten complacent, Iris. I figure I'd make a stand. That was foolish. You risked everything. I did what I had to. What any man would have done. You're a strange one. Mike, did you hit him? Yes. How hard? Hard enough to get me in here. Thank Lennon. Excuse me? You're not like any party member I've met here. You break for the wrong reasons. You talk about this plan you're willing to give yourself for. I don't know what it is, so I can't give myself to it. But I can give myself to what's right. I will tell you what it is. Wouldn't you be in trouble? I am in enough trouble already. Surely you have guessed the truth, Mike. That I am Inuit Snow. No. I can't take this life any longer. I want out. I'll take the whole plan down if you can guarantee my safety. You are my contact at the Pentagon, yes? Keep quiet. I am. I suspected from your clipboard. I knew it when I heard about your arrest. I'll go with you. If I may take down Frost. I'll see that he gets justice when I'm out of here. I will go into hiding. The plan is this. Moscow is set to invade Alaska soon. To take it back, they say. They want to establish a stronghold on the North American continent. The package that Lawrence will give Dan contains the codes and frequencies for our loyalists to coordinate the attack from Washington. Slowly, our plants and all the Alaskan bases are causing sabotage. When the Air Force and the Army attempt to defend Alaska, they will fail. My God. There is no God, Mike. You know it. If there were, he would take pity on such as me. Get out of here, Iris. Hide. I'll come for you when I can. I hope so. Just this once. I will pray. Excuse me, ma'am. What is it? The colonel would like to see you now, ma'am. Oh, he would? Yes, ma'am. May I go to see him on my own? He ordered me to accompany you, ma'am. I see. Well, if he must see me, then he must. This way, ma'am. I had iron bars in my face, thick and unshakable. I'd never felt more helpless in my life. I had to get out, fast. The Pentagon had to learn the truth, but my prison had no window. I spent the next few hours as a caged lion, tapping Morse code against the bars in case someone heard me. Eventually, someone did. I heard the concrete slide under my cot. I bent down to see who it was. We must get out of here, comrade. It's good to see you. The sooner we leave, the better. Lawrence arranged for escape tunnels to be built under all the cells. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but you couldn't have come any sooner. If you want the truth, comrade, I wasn't planning on setting you free today. But we have to run. After you left, I grilled Lawrence and repeated the situation to Central, who was Moscow who got back to me. The leaders weren't fully appraised of the Frost situation. They assumed the bureaucrats had everything under control. But now they feel the situation is too volatile. They don't know who Frost has spoken with or where his tapes are. They're sending bombers. They want to wipe out the whole base in one fell swoop to protect the plan. We must escape. All party members are evacuated. Now! How long do we have? I don't know. We have to hurry. Have you spoken to Comrade Iris? No, she's still with Frost. I have to get to her. Look, man, there isn't time. They could be here any minute. Then you run. But take me to wherever Frost is holed up now. If I'm blown to bits, then so be it. At least I'll die doing what I could to save Iris. Dan dropped me off by the colonel's house. I was unarmed, still in my prison attire, but that wouldn't stop me. It was evening. I was hidden well. An armed soldier waited before the gate. Funny thing about walls. They make it easier to throw your voice and scare a man. Who's there? It's me, sonny boy. You locked me up, but I've walked through the walls. How can you call yourself a soldier when you know what's happening in that house behind you? You're supposed to protect the innocent. Stay where you are. I'll fire if you come any closer. There's a move they use in wrestling called a sleeper hold. Being in the business I'm in, I've used it enough times. You use some distraction, like a rock on the ground behind the fellow. Then he turns. 
You get behind him. You grab his neck with one arm and the other around his head. You cut the air from his lungs and the blood from his brain. He struggles for a while, but at least he can't shout. He drops, limp. Usually he'll wake up later with a hell of a headache. But not that poor soldier. I was mad, but part of me wanted to save him. It killed me to step away. I took his gun first and walked off to make up for what I'd done. Frost was overconfident. His front door was open. Put down your fork, Frost. Keep your hands where I can see them. Michael! Well, it's our stupid little Red, who should be up for a court-martial. Take a chair. We're finishing dinner. He hasn't touched me. Don't do anything rash. It doesn't matter what I do. Not anymore. You can't hide behind your rank any longer, Colonel. Any more than you can hide behind this table. You're not the only one with a pistol, comrade. Iris, don't move. I'm right behind you now. That's a good girl. Just stand still, arms to your sides. You'll protect me, won't you, sweetheart? Your friend Michael can't get a good shot around you. He was right, too. Hiding behind her like a coward, I couldn't risk a shot. Not that I would have tried. There were still soldiers around. The bang of a gun would attract them. What's it going to be, Michael? I might let her go and just shoot you. I can do anything I want to a red. You bring it on yourselves. Did you tell him everything about the plan, Iris? He knows it all. He found out on his own. <laughs> Alaskan conspiracies. If the communist pilots are as incompetent as their saboteurs, we could beat them back in an hour, even with slipshot equipment. If you know the plan, you know that means we'll have to kill you. Strange that your superiors have never made such a threat to me. And I'll remind you, blind and deaf as you seem to be, that I have the muzzle of my gun nestled gently into Iris's temple. Step towards me and bang! Neither of us wants that. So I want you to put that gun on the floor. Do it! Slowly... Yes. Lower. There. All right. Just like that. Let it go. Good. Now, stand up again. Yes, Colonel Frost. Hands behind your head. Good. I'll call for my men, have you taken away, and finish my dinner. Everything will be as it was. As it should be. You've won, Frost. May I say goodbye to Iris first? You can let go of me now, Nathan. Michael's no threat. Not yet, dearest. Michael, you may say your goodbyes. Iris, don't worry about me. You're a strong woman. Stronger than I'll ever know. You can hold yourself steady as a rock, can't you? That I can. I'll make do. I'm a good red. I'm cagey, slippery, and athletic. I played all the sports in college. Ever hear of soccer? You can't use your hands. You kick things off the ground. Like the gun I just put down. What? I caught it! No! Iris's steady hand caught the gun I'd kicked to her. Without hesitation, she planted it into Frost. Oh. Those rolls of flesh around his gut made the perfect silencer. No one heard his cry. Oh, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. I had to come back for you, Iris. Look, we've no time. Moscow is sending bombers to level the base, thanks to Frost's blabbermouth. No! We have to run. Frost, I know you can still hear me. Just one thing I want you to know. I may be a red. I'm proud of that. To me, it means I have the red blood of an American man in my veins. Oh. I'll never understand why Dan was waiting for us in that car. Perhaps Iris' plight had softened his hard, commy heart. He drove us out, past the checkpoints, answering questions and flashing our papers. We hardly had left the base when he spotted the planes overhead. Dan drove us across a stretch to a field where Lawrence was beckoning to us. We pulled over and ditched the car. This way. The community bomb shelter is nearby, just over the hill. Is everyone else safe? Yes. You're the last. I feared I'd lost you. Forever. ran up the hill as the first missiles flew. The explosions and sirens were deafening. Our own shadows were illuminated in orange before us. We were over the hill, yards from the open door of the bunker, with one set of footsteps behind me stopped. Dan pushed me into the bunker before I turned around to check on Iris. One last look. Hit him hard! Iris! She was illuminated in gold at the top of the hill. 
paralyzed by the rush of light and smoke that enveloped her. Dan barely shut the door in time. Iris! She stopped! There's nothing we can do! We spent hours, maybe days, I don't know, in the bunker before we heard metal against the door. The rescue crew from the Pentagon had arrived for me. Iris was still out there. Or, I should say, an ashen carving of her remained on the hill, frozen in time. A grim reminder that in this business, you can't save everyone, even the ones who need it the most. You wouldn't have heard about the bombing in the paper. If you had a loved one stationed there, you would have received a letter in the mail announcing their death under classified circumstances, giving their lives for their country. Our government doesn't want a war with Russia if they can help it, and they wanted me to continue doing my job. I stayed on, exposing the menace by remaining a part of it. My shadow's the only one who walked beside me. I was a communist for the CIA! So it ends, my friends, and the world grows a little darker. Who is more evil, the traitor or the man who profits from the other's treason? When you hear those who speak out against this Cold War, have you considered that they may have agendas of their own? Must we as good citizens be doubly vigilant in this new world where the Reds walk invisible among us? I don't know about you, but after tonight's tale, I wouldn't be caught dead out after dark. After Dark, brought to you each week on this station by the makers of Winsley Wheat, features the incredibly talented, prolific, prestigious, and all-around amazing Leonard Allen. Tune in next week for another tale of mystery and fright, right here on After Dark. Perfect people, great show. It'll give Huack a reason to love us and Fred Ziv a reason to sue us. <laughs> Let's get to the real show, people. Hey, Mr. Allen. Yes? Great job. Really terrific work. Don't go anywhere. Julie, hey. What's the matter? Mr. Allen must be all burned out from his performance. From his two lines. I have to run to the other gig. Just drop him somewhere. Mr. Stroud's office. All right. Len... Len, are you tired? I am. My arm's asleep, and it's spreading. So you can walk, though. I can walk. You won't have to go far. Down the hall. Why do you want to sleep? You did a show. A Hollywood show. You should have a martini in one hand and a broad in the other. You should see fear in your competition's eyes as they realize how good you are. You're excited. You are too. I know you are. You made up your lines. You did my voice. Hey, I'm atmosphere, that's all. You're doing fine, Len. Ask her what time it is. You ask her. They're getting sloppy with you. They aren't putting on the dog and pony show they used to. They let you hear the shepherd's ceremony for crying out loud. Ask her the time. I don't see why. Mr. Allen, go on inside. Okay. Julie, what time is it? It's 7.54. Bob will pick you up in half an hour. Doesn't Bob do his show live for the West Coast? Yes, he starts at 8, right on the money. Son of a gun! He's left his papers all over the place. Tell him to clean his office, would you? Sure. I'll have to leave you in his waiting room. Would you go inside? That's a closet. No, Len. Len, it's a waiting room. Every week. Now on, you sing, and then you're stuffed in the waiting room while Bob does his show. You're a sacrifice for the altar, only you aren't tenderized yet. You're meat that bastes itself. Want to know why? Len, Len, please go in the waiting room. I want to know. Ask Bob. 
I think I will. Julie, is that the key to the waiting room? You'll be safe in there, Len. I know. So will you. Hey! <laughs> let me go! Stop it! Give, give those back! I need to ask him. You can't treat me like that. Bob's going to hear about this. Hey! It, it's dark in here. Let me out. You can't leave me in here. They'll butcher you for this. You'd stop me from seeing Bob. That's the spirit. She'll be fine for now. You're dead, Len. She's the one in trouble, not you. They still need you. Where's Bob? Hurry back to your studio. You might catch a straggler running to Bob's show. Help me! Somebody? Anybody? He's loose! Chop, chop, get it going. I'll watch the hall. Pay dirt, my friend. They led you to Bob. You don't know if Bob's in there. Ask the nice gentleman by the door. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Allen. Is Bob in there? What are you doing here? I want to see Bob. Where's Julie? Indisposed. Can I talk to Bob? I'm calling security. But Bob's doing his show in there? Uh, sure. Listen, you stay there. Right there. You will, won't you? I'll be here. Good. You wait. It's locked. You have keys. A whole ring of them. I do? Lift your hand up to your face. Oh, I do. Try them all. <laughs> Got it. He's already started. I can't interrupt him now. You will. From Hollywood, USA, Old Maggie Mopheads presents Master Stroud's Grimoire of Horror. All the tales you fear the most. Hungry goblins, scary ghosts, broadcasting live from coast to coast. Why, hello. I'm sorry, I didn't see you there hiding in the corner. May I see some identification? You can't be too careful these days. That was my line. Who am I? Why, Master Stroud in the flesh. Were you expecting someone else? Not tonight. Sure you remember me. Terror of the airwaves. I said that. Not good enough. You want to see my papers? They're all here, all in order. I've nothing to hide, just like the hero of tonight's tale. Why is he saying my lines? You know why. He has the dirty job of finding traitors to our great nation. But his name will never be in a history book. Let me ask you... How well do you know your best friend? No. No, I won't. Your co-workers? Not him. Do you think they're jealous of that raise you earned? The one that gave you a better car? A better garden? They never wanted him. Maybe they wonder if the world would be a better place if everyone was equal and you were strung up by your boots. Now you're getting it. Michael Svelte finds people like this in a tale I'm calling... I was a communist for the CIA. Bob! What are you doing? Mr. Allen, it's a live show. Tell me I'm wrong, Bob. Get him out of there. You want some advice? Sure. If they're in your way, knock them aside. That's it, mister. Out! Uh, technical difficulties. We'll be right back to our thrilling show. Out of my way! It's all right. Let him come. That's right. That's right. Pretend I'm the star. Step aside, boys. Easy, Len. Len, it's okay, Len. I'll get you home, Len. You've been doing something to me. Juju, mind trickery. I can't make you do anything you don't want, Len. You're damned right you can't. I'm angry right now. It's to be expected, Len. Boys, back off more. Give Mr. Allen some space. He's not himself. The heck I'm not. You threw two men into the control board. With your own hands, Len. You can't do that. Don't change the subject. I figured it out. Why I'm here in Hollywood. Why I haven't written Gwen. Why I'm hosting some abomination of a show. The reanimated corpse of After Dark. 
You won't let me go, Bob. I don't know what you're talking about. You're a lonely man, Bob. You had no friends before me, and you'll have no friends after me. When I couldn't get a job here, you gave me one, and it's a joke. A child could see through it. So you made me very, very dumb. Len, please, what does that sound like to you? You made me only want one thing. This sham of a show. Nothing more. You made me want it so bad, it didn't even occur to me that I could leave it. Something's wrong with you, Len, and it's nothing I've done. I, I can't make you as strong as you are now. Let him have it. You took me away. And I don't know how. And I don't know what to do. I thought they hired you because they saw some talent in you. That you were the better man. I was jealous, but I knew you. I thought you deserved it. I was proud you'd caught the chance to hit it big. I wished it was me. I still do. Oh, every day when you look in that mirror in your bathroom and slather on that cream, they hired you to be me. Len. That's all you are. You ape my words, ape my voice. Not my voice, Krask's voice. You can't be anything but me. They don't want you. They want Krask. And I'm Krask! But they got you first, because you're a damn toady, sycophant. You didn't steal my show. That's what Matt and Isabel thought, but they were wrong. You stole me. <laughs> Easy, Len. Let's not do anything that you're going to regret. You want me. You want me bad, and I'm here, Bob. Let go of me. Go ahead. Touch me, Bob. Feel my cheek. That's as close as you're going to get to being me. Tell me, Bob. Make me understand. I've told you everything, Len. Why are you repeating words that I made up a half hour ago? You had a good introduction. Oh, yes. It was the best. Mwah. Poetry. Shakespeare right there. Why do you want to be me so much? Is it part of the juju? Are they keeping you here too? Can I set you free? I don't have to do anything I don't want to. Quite so. Quite so. You're a good, honorable toady doing the job you were hired for. To be me for a hundred episodes. A lonely boy keeping me for company. Want me to sing for you in my little cage? No, Len. You can go if you want to. No. No one's making you stay. Not anymore. Not anymore. Right. You're not going to tell me why you're playing me, are you? I can't, Len. And you won't tell me why you had me host that After Dark farce, will you? I've wanted to. How easy do you think this is for me? You only came here a few weeks ago. I have to live this. I have to drive to that squalid apartment, drink myself to sleep, and get dressed in a hangover because I was recruited. I don't have any contacts here. And none of my boys here will let me forget it. Feels good to let it out, doesn't it? I work here. I have a future. I needed you a little longer, that's all. You can't blame me, can you? Of course not. You're my pal, Bob. Now, I'm going to go and collect my clothes from the apartment. I have the key. Don't worry, I'll leave it behind on the table. You know, you are looking a little old for your age. I live with the truth. You keep at it, then. Keep on playing the great, accessible Leonard Allen. I'll tell you. If you want to be me so much... You start at the bottom, like I did. Get out of here. Wait. Give me a check. The studio already gave you one. I'm breaking my contract. They'll want it back. And you've been controlling me with it. I can't look at it again. All right. Here. That should cover your expenses out of town. I didn't say I was leaving. Good work. Doing the right thing is always painful. <sighs> Where's a cheap bar? 
Think they'll take a check? You can handle it yourself from now on. I told you, we changed the ending. Get you free. You're, You're out, out of, of his hands. hands. Maybe, Maybe Hollywood, Hollywood isn't, isn't the, the place, place for you. you. Maybe it is. Great food, great, great bars, great, great women. Why, thanks, Matt. Is he out of the building yet? But maybe I did help a bit. Your buddy, Krask. Drink a toast to me, wherever you go, will you? <sighs> okay, he's out. I'm dropping the circle now. You'll lose your link to him. Go. <sighs> I need chocolate. So do I. Ew, forget it. Shouldn't have left it in the California sun. We should move. The shepherd will track us here. Good thought. Won't Alan be surprised to see us? He'll say no. I know. No more after dark. The prayer's over. It can't hurt to try, though. Sure. Alan had the right idea. Where's a good bar near here? So, that's my story. My first step into Hollywood. I've forgotten most of it over the years, but I could never listen to Stroud's show again. That night, I moved into an apartment across town. And I realized that all my business cards had the number for Bob's agency on them. I ordered more the next morning. I was near one of the studios where I'd interviewed before, and I figured I'd give him my motel number just in case. The girl I interviewed with took a new resume since she'd lost my old one. I had a feeling she'd lose this one, too. On my way out, I thought I'd abuse my studio pass before it expired and caught a smoke behind one of their sound stages. <sighs> well, what are we going to do now? There's always the mansion of terror. After Stroud's affair, we could use more cleaning staff. Eh, come off it. I'm getting a real job. That's going real well for you. How you'll survive, that's a mystery I want to remain unsolved. Excuse me, that voice you're doing, is that... Damien Krask? Dr. Damien Krask, at your service, sir. And I'm Mr. Leonard Allen. Uh, pleasure to meet you. I thought that was you. Mr. Wells was telling us about you at the symposium the other day. I used to listen to your show all the time. Oh, well, thank you. We had some great people working on it. So what are you doing here? Interviewing. How's that going? Not well. Oh. Listen, I'm a director, but I wouldn't be here if somebody hadn't given me a break. If you want a few weeks' work, our script girl went and got herself pregnant, so she's off the set for a while. I'd hate to offer it to you, Mr. Allen, though. <sighs> I wouldn't mind. Are you sure? A foot in the door is a foot in the door. I'll talk to my producers, but I'm sure they'd let you on board. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr... Johansson, come this way. Wait till I tell the guys. I learned the hard way that to get hired in Hollywood, you have to talk with the people who are really doing the work. Not those office types. I began as the humble script girl. Met people, impressed people, and went on to do odd work from studio to studio, eventually to MGM. That first day, I followed Mr. Johansson around, and he sent me off at lunchtime with a list of sandwiches for the crew. My heavens! <laughs> Matt! Isabel! What are you doing out this way? You didn't tell us your number, Sunshine. How's it going? Oh, great. Hey, are you staying in town? I have to run for a job I'm on, but hey, afterwards, we should go out. Our plane leaves this afternoon. Oh, uh, you're coming back, though. Sure. Uh, look, Len, we were wondering... Oh, don't start. We were wondering if you'd come home with us to finish after dark. Winsley Weed is waiting for you, baby. <laughs> I've been hired. Uh, I can't change your mind. I'm sorry. Oh, Matt, Isabel, I have to run. I'll call you, though, I promise. We'll pray for you. Goodbye, Len. Bye, pal. I'll miss both of you. Hey, eat at Pink's. Bob never goes there. <sighs> it's not fair. Maybe we'll get him back. 
someday. Yes, someday. Oh. Hello, Bob. Off my property now, folks. I've got boys itching to kill the two of you. Why? You've got your copy of the prayer. What more do you want? The original. The one Alan never finished. Go. Run. I know you were the ones who set him free. I'll never forgive you for prying him from me. Start walking, Matt. Right. It's not over. You can't protect him forever. I'll get him back someday. I'll get him here in Hollywood. Finishing the job he started. Come hell or high water! Is she in? Come on, bring Ellen. Where is she? The hell the microphone? She's trying to call out from the radio room. Hickory, start the chainsaw. Please work. Come on, Alan. Into Hello? the kitchen. Mr. Lewis? I'm going. Everyone? <laughs> Scotty, we're cutting our way in there. No, no. We'll sever the microphone table. Please, whoever you are. I need to pull out. Now in trouble. Is this to be a soldering iron in the table drawer? No! Wait! Shh! Who oh, are you? No, fixing things. It's in there with her. Where are you? No calling for help. Go! It'll be my friend you call. It's having fun with her. Drill the wall while it's distracted. Pick up the drill, Alan. All right. Get ready with another towel if I need it. Where do you want me to drill? In the pantry where I tried before. Don't kill me, Wall. Please don't kill me. Try it again. You know what it did to your friend here. You'll live through another swipe or two. Do it. Keep cutting. I'll be in the entryway. Two creatures are distracted. We'll see if they can still hold the front door now. It worked! Front door's open. Evac now, out of the lighthouse. I was almost in. She didn't make the call. It wouldn't have let her. Hold the door, I've got Alan. I'm moving! Move faster! Damn it, we're blocked! Can you reach those cables in the kitchen? Alan, pick up those cables. I have them! Shock the feathers! You're trying to get me killed! Shock them! We're out! Get in the truck! They're coming for us. Concussion epoxy! I only have two. One. Make them count. I can't avoid them all. Concussion one. Careful. Don't get them too mad. Almost there, boys. Fire in a hole! Ben! What about Scotty? She's on her own. If she's alive, we'll deal with her later. It's still in the radio room. I think it's gone. It slashed off the cables. I can't call out. What's it doing? Destroying our engine so we can't leave. Will it kill us? Not unless we provoke it. Hickory? The wards are still up. The demon can't see us. The one outside? The one in the tunnel. The big tar thing. The speed bump! We got one of its recent sheddings. I used it to tune the wards. We'll need the chain. Take a length, ma'am. I found the tasers. Wrap your chain in the garbage bag. Ready? Pray. Oh, oh sage, sage, oh teacher. teacher. We, we seek, seek the, the path, path of binding. binding. This is iron to do our, our bidding. bidding. The way, way to you we're finding. finding. Let's get them. Alan's out first. Are you sure about this? Oh, hey! They like to play. They want us to move first. On your word. Give Alan the taser. Alan, shock the ground. I don't care if it's raining. Yes, ma'am. Here goes! Shock the feather! Get them back! Bind, bind, bind! Again! Fine, fine, fine! That's both of them. We should be safe. 
We caught them by their claws. Their hands are stuck in the chains. They won't hold for long. Back inside the lighthouse. You know what this means, Alan? No one's looking out for you and your cellar anymore. The radio door is open. The girl's gone. Dickory, tear this place apart to find her. I'll take that taser, Alan. She won't get far. I took care of her phone. Mr. Wingbeast. Mr. Wingbeast? I think we're clear. Try the drill now. On it. I don't see anything. Just the beams. And the outer wall. It's a little distorted. How much time do I have? The boat will be here in ten minutes. Then I can't do it. Give me half a day, maybe, but they've set up a good system here. No sign of her. Find anything? No, we came too early. I don't have time to figure it out. Settle down. Hickory, you and I will prep Alan for evac. Get the rope, repellers, and the stretcher out of the van. Dickory, watch for the girl until the boat arrives. When it does, prepare to evacuate over the cliff. That includes Alan. There's the boat. I'm dropping the signal flare. Make sure Alan's secure on that stretcher. Dickory, they're here. Haven't found the girl yet. Come back, we're leaving. Right? Ready? Oh boy! He's tied good. Ready. Scotty, where are you? In the wood cubby in the tool shed. There's spiders and ick, but I'm okay. They're lowering me towards the boat. They called off the search for you. When they're off the island, you have to run for help. If the wind creature doesn't get me. They've caught both the creatures. By their van. Stay away from the plastic bags. Ow! I swung into the cliff. Same cliff that blew those shavings over me? The boat's parked below it. Jessie was gabbing about you insulting someone down here yesterday. She thinks spirits are everywhere. She's probably right. But they're not doing me any good. What if they were? What if... I dumped something else down there. Scotty? The boat's anchored under the cliff, right? We have some fertilizer bags in the shed. Crass took them off? Maybe? I don't know. Who could get me mad? They might hold the boat. Uh, I can't tell you what to do. But at least get a good look at the boat. Make sure you can describe it and call the Coast Guard. My phone's gone. Or do it at Mr. Lewis's. They said something about having their own wards up, too. That's probably how they got past the speed bump. Wards aren't any good if you know what to look for, though. Scotty, I'm almost down. The guys in the boat are about to catch me. I have to be quiet. I'll talk what I can. Contact. So you have him. We're dropping the ropes and climbing down. Your gold. Mr. Allen! I'm coming! I'm coming! Don't go! Oh, God. Don't leave. Dear whoever I did the Alice's restaurant on the other day, I'm really sorry for this, but I need your help, and I don't know what you like. Please, please work, and don't take it out on me. No! I just missed them! Goodbye, Scotty. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen! Crap! Mr. Lewis will be pissed! He'll probably start a drum circle or something! Ah! Don't hurt me! Allen is taken! You must recover him! I can't! He's on a speedboat! He gets away! Soon he cannot be seen! I have to get Mr. Lewis! Too long! Into the water with you! It's rough! I can't swim well! There's something in the water! Won't hurt you! Please let me get to Mr. Lewis! We throw you in! No! Please! It's too rough to swim! I don't have a boat! 
there's only an inflatable raft in the shed. It doesn't even have a motor. Take it. The raft is fine. Take what else you need. Be quick. It can't catch a speedboat. No, you get the one who can. He is fast. He sees Alan and the Mammons. Oh! He will come when you are off the island. But he'll drag me back. Things tell him what is wrong. Personal things. Gather personal things. Okay. Okay, I'll look for some. Be quick. Oh, wherever they are. Over, under, through the rabbit hole, tighten. Put the backpack on. Hey, wing spirit. A little help getting down the rope? Of course not. That would make sense. I mean, lowering myself down the cliff. Not looking down. Not looking down. Not letting go. Not letting go. Someone's going to pay for this. When I'm out of college, I swear, all my debts better be paid off. Mom better send me to Japan for a year. With a stipend. Please, whatever you are in the water, don't hurt me. Ask the flappy things. God, I hope this raft inflates right side up. Now, let's jump in the water. Any time now. Don't think. One, two. Life jackets? I think I'm going to kiss you. Salty! Wind is going the right way. I'm off the island. Come on, you big stupid lump of tar! I didn't ask Mr. Lewis's permission to leave the island! Come on! Here! Personal things! Personal things! No! No, look! Alan's gone! Alan! See? His shoes! He's not in the lighthouse! Yes! You understand! Gone! No! I know where he is! Hickory! Diggory! Dot! This is the bag they brought their tools in. See it? Yes! Good bump. One of them was cut. Very badly. This towel is covered with his blood. Yes! Blood! You like blood. Here! You go ahead and feed that. And this is bag of fertilizer I dumped on their boat. It smells like this. If you can smell. Okay, I'm sorry. Get Alan. Alan! Before he disappears. Still clear. Good job, men. Thank you, ma'am. Only better once I'm off these perks. I hate painkillers. I know you do. You wouldn't believe how hard I'm trying not to fall over now. Uh, how much longer? <laughs> not that it matters to you. Business is business, Len. You're going to help us with a great service. 
I can't wait. You never said how you know about the sloth in my kitchen. It's a bug we planted. Well, that was no bug. You perceive things differently in your dream state. We planted the bug when one of our spies took a tour of the lighthouse a while back. I took it with us, so they're not going to find us. Lovely. Ma'am, come here a second. What's up? Am I the only one seeing that? Seeing what? That orange raft. It's in our wake. I think it's gaining on us. It can't be. You're right. What's the matter? Binoculars, now. How are the wards holding up? They were fine when we left. That thing's cutting through the water faster than we are. There's someone in the raft, too. I can't make out who it is. Its wake doesn't look right. Does it have a motor? I don't think so. The wards are holding. It shouldn't see us. Unless it knows exactly what to look for. The towel. We left the towel behind. It's locked on you, Dickory. Son of a gun! Give me a life preserver and a GPS. I'll jump for it. You should be able to get away. It's too late. It can sense all of us now. What can we do to hurt it? Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? Can't we summon fire? On the ocean? It's half submerged anyway. All our heavy artillery was in the van. What do we do? Threaten to kill Alan? It's not smart enough to understand that. And it's enraged. So what do we do? Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen? Allen? Uh, what? Good gods, man. What do I have to do to keep you here? Chain you to the radio? We have chain in the tool shed, right, Jesse? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, Allen, you wouldn't believe what Scotty did for you. Scotty? Scotty! Oh, there you are. You're okay. I hope so. How do you feel? Like my head never left the boat. You want to grab the walls to stop the room from spinning? You fainted when I found you. And I almost did, too, when I heard what happened. Scotty did some stupid, reckless things to find you. I'm so proud of her. What about those people who took me? The bump dragged them under the water. I couldn't watch. Those scumbags were good. Before I hired them, I gave their credentials such a checking. The CIA would have complained about me being invasive. They probably weren't the real contractors. Don't defend her, David. She can feel guilty for once. <sighs> I'm glad you're safe, Len. We've got their scent, their biorhythms, their chakras. We know them inside and out. Nobody associated with them will ever make it in here again. If anyone so much as grazes them at the market, the bumble grab them like a bug in a box. What about the things in the lighthouse? With the feathers and claws? I've never heard of anything like that. Uh, wings? Uh-huh. Uh, Scotty, d don't leave yet. Tell us about them outside. Uh, Len, we're going to let you rest up. I thought this was going to be easy with you. You'd come, do seven shows, and pfft, that'd be it. Things never work that easily around me. Uh, no, they don't. We have to stop meeting like this. You get some sleep and we'll get back on track. Uh, no more surprises. <sighs> My favorite words. Hey, Orson and Mr. Obler came to see you. Oh, hello, Orson. Hello, Mr. Obler. Oh, you're being sweet. Oh, you've got some dirty paws there. <sighs> we'll leave you to it. Night, Len. Bye, Mr. Allen. Bye, Len. Goodbye. She's going to be angry. So very angry. I can't wait.
The Mask of Inanna, Episode 4, The Rescuers, was written and directed by Alicia E. Goranson for the Post Meridian Radio Players. The modern day cast featured Andrew Lebrun as Leonard Allen, Nellie Farrington as Scotty Harper, Catherine Bryant as Jesse McAllister, and Doug Miller as David Lewis, with Jennifer Pelland as Dot, Jason Merrill as Hickory, Santiago Rivas as Dickory, Julia Lunetta as Mr. Obler and Juniper, Carrie Babish as Orson, and Heidi Clark as the introducer. The 1950s and After Dark casts included Andrew Lebrun as Leonard Allen and Dr. Damian Krask, James Scheffler as Bob Stroud, Marley Norton as Isabel Huddleston, Renee Johnson as Julie, and Mike Babish as the announcer and Matt Lerner, with Brian Edgar as Dan, Neil Leahy as Lawrence, Neil Marsh as the guard, Vicki Bloom as the bee, Emma Lathan and Lisa Sturgeon as the Winsley Wheat singers, and special guest stars John Desheen as Mike Svelt, Kamala Dolanova as Iris, and Somerville's own Tom Champion as Colonel Frost. Studio recording and post-production for The Mask of Anana was performed by Alicia E. Goranson, with production assistance from Paul Dworkin, Emma Lathan, and Lisa Sturgeon. The script editor was Vicki Bloom. Original music was composed and rendered by Neil Marsh, and the After Dark theme was composed by Sir Arthur Sullivan. All interstitial music is available in the public domain. The producer and series developer is Alicia E. Goranson. The creator of The Mask of Inanna and executive producer for the Post Meridian Radio Players is Neil Marsh. For more information, please visit our website at themaskofinana.com. This has been a Hub of the Universe production. Hey, Billy, why do you look so down? Aw, Dad, I got a computer, a PlayStation, and a barn full of iguanas, and I'm still bored. (sighs) Gee, Billy, when I was your age, I would read lots of stories in pulp magazines. Oh, with stories of weird adventure and fantasy, horror, satire, and lots of action. Wow, that sounds great, Dad. Yeah, I sure wish there was something like that right now. (laughs) There is Daddy-O. Who are you? I'm Dr. Mary Von Rocksprocket, host of the Twisted Pulp Radio Hour. And now there's... Yeah? Twisted Pulp Magazine! (laughs) What's that, Doctor? Why, it is a return to greatness. Available on all your digital devices. That is what it is. Look! Whoa! Dad, this looks awesome! Exciting and, dare I say it, very unwholesome. You definitely have that right, my good man. Ha ha! <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Mary. My pleasure, Billy. And just between you and me, I am not sure that this man is really your father. Bye. Dad? Uh, just read your Twisted Pulp magazine, Billy. Twisted Pulp magazine, available in dark alleyways behind meth labs everywhere or at digitalvaudeville.com that is d-i-g-i-t-a-l-v-a-u-d-e-v-i-l-l-e dot com